Hello. Hello. Oh, try it again. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Okay. So we get to talk about secure security, secure soft software. Um, you guys know this. This has become probably the number one topic uh, in, in software these days uh, because of all the security breaches we've had and because as you know, software often <clears throat> lasts years and decades. So there's software that was basically engineered in the 1980s and the 1990s where um, you had certain um, expectations about connectivity that were completely shattered in the 90s when the internet came along. And now you have the ability to people um, to remotely um, attack software. In addition, you've probably heard the term Internet of Things or IoT. And what that means is everything around us is becoming a computer or is, is a computer embedded inside of it, like your thermostat at your house, which if you ever looked at an old thermostat, was a pretty clever device. It was a little metal tube with a bead of mercury in it and um, the little metal tube would flop back on forth ba <clears throat> based on the expansion of the mercury and make connections, physical, physical connections, metal to metal to complete circuits. And now everything is temperature sensor and, um, and uh, chips and logic and those little thermostats, the, the quote smart thermostats um, actually have you know, a fully functional Linux operating system inside of them, a lot of them do, or at least the kernel of the Linux operating systems. Well, once you get an operating system, you've got a computer. And once you've got a computer, you've got something that can be attacked. And the problem is, let's take your Fitbit, for example. You've got something on your wrist and that thing talks to your phone. And your Fitbit links up to your phone and in order for that to happen, there had to be certain security protocols. So the phone sees the Fitbit as a trusted source, a trusted source of communication, a trusted source of commands. Well, what if your Fitbit gets hacked? Now, it, nobody cares if your Fitbit gets hacked. Now it's a vector where the Fitbit, the hacked Fitbit can now try to attack your phone and your phone already trusts it. So it's not so much that these things can do damage inherently in and of themselves, but often they become avenues for accessing other components of a system where more damage can be done. <clears throat> the other thing that can happen is, um, uh, we'll talk about denial of service attacks. Denial of service attacks are basically when you flood something with so many bogus requests that legitimate requests can't get served and therefore you're denying the service. Well, you may have heard of a botnet or an, a, a bot army. So what you do is you create software uh, that goes around and tries to replicate itself on a bunch of different um, other uh, processors. And these processors nowadays can be televisions and thermostats and watches and Fitbits and toasters and refrigerators and anything that contains, you know, anything, any of these so-called smart things. And you get a botnet of, you know, 100,000 processors, and then you tell them all to go attack, you know, Bank of America or Yahoo or wherever, 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 and basically flood that thing with all these, with all these bogus requests so that real requests can't get through. <clears throat> so because we have seen so many uh, security failures, uh, security breaches, information being stolen, uh, because the interconnectivity of things makes this more possible and more relevant, because the 
uh, availability of cloud storage instead of personal storage on a machine. Uh, all of these things have come together to make security a really top level issue. So keep your eye out in the news. There's, there's stuff out there. Um, and some of it is remarkably simple that shows that when the software was designed, it was not designed with the intention of being secure. Now people are saying from the start, from the ground up, if you build software, we want it to be secure. So that's the introduction to that thing. So some basic definitions. Ta-da! Often gets identified late in the life cycle. By late now, remember some of these things are you know 10 years later to 15 years later, because when the software was designed, the attack vectors, the attack mechanisms didn't exist. So nowadays, if you think in terms of ground up, you know what, what causes software security problems? Don't satisfy your requirements, erroneous or missing requirements. Uh, also, just bad coding. Um, uh, you always want to explicitly control the state of your software. If you don't control the state of your software, that's an opportunity for malicious code to take advantage of that. You know, the, the uh, one form of attack, I'm not even sure if we can call it a form of attack, is just to try to poke at software with weird stuff and see if you can get it into an unstable state and then take advantage of that unstable state. Why would you be able to take advantage of the software? Not so much what the software can and cannot do necessarily, but again, it it is a trusted entity inside of a system. And once you drill inside that trusted entity, you may be able to burrow your way deeper into the system. Well, what do you know? We're back to requirements engineering. Now on top of that, you know, th th this slide is telling you nothing you, you don't already know. It's just casting it in the secure software forum. Requirements engineering, right? So that's what uh, uh, everything always seems to come back to. And then once you have your requirements done, then it's about review, review, review. Right? Before we talked about coding reviews, requirements reviews, design reviews, well, security reviews, and then testing. Uh, this you can think of security as a non-functional attribute. Um, I am not asking you to focus on functional attributes of software in this course very much. Like when I'm have, having you do requirement specifications, the SRS is primarily focusing on the functional attributes. There is a section in there for the non-functional for the user interfaces, uh, but um, uh, I'm, I'm really having you focus on the functional software specifications. That's where all your test cases are going to come. So we know the non-functional stuff are things like uh, availability and um, um, quality of service, you know, that kind of thing. You know, we can add security to the mix. All right, well, we're going to go over some of these things in more detail, but look at the definitions. And I've underlined, hopefully, the key words here. Safety. Why would software be unsafe? Well, can you can you think of a situation where bad software would be unsafe? Boeing 737. How about that one? Any others? Um, when I was um, at my internship, a big part of my job was to make sure that code wasn't too complex because more complex code is more susceptible to, um, you know, being attacked just because it's confusing. Right. It has more alleyways and stuff. Uh, I'm writing down a term and I'm going to try to remember to talk about it at the end of the lecture. That's an interesting point. How about safety? Is there any software that you know of in your life, if the software is wrong, you might have, be in danger? Anybody have airbags in their car? I hope so. How do those get deployed in a crash? Sensor, processor, airbag. What if the processor's wrong? How about non-skid brakes? 
Think through this stuff. The stuff around you can be dangerous from a software aspect because of a software failure. The ones we tend to think of, I think, is this next line, protecting system data. And why do we think of that? Because you keep hearing in the news, oh, you know, Visa just reported that 100 million people's credit card information was stolen. Now, be aware, often when they're saying that, what they're talking about is the encrypted data was stolen, which may, means that you know, there may be some risk, but it's not like it was plain text uh, all of your all of your information was stolen. Uh, however, um, the, sometimes plain text information is stolen. Plain text meaning, you know, you can read it like a human being, as opposed to encrypted data uh, against disclosure, modification, or destruction. Uh, protection of the computer systems themselves. Um, <clears throat> some viruses are particularly. I'm going to say 10 or 15 years ago, were actually destructive to the computer. The viruses that would literally, you know, the early viruses would literally erase your hard drive, right? Remove all your files, reformat hard drive. Um, that was a, a failure, oh, well, of the data, but also uh, of the system, computer system itself. And some, uh, some software could literally take apart your operating system, right? Could, could potentially harm the physical aspects of your computer. Uh, a, a famous aspect of that, I can't remember when this was, maybe 20 years ago. Somehow, somehow uh, in the nuclear operations in Iran where they were developing uh, nuclear fuel and they had all of these, <clears throat> all of these um, um, centrifuges that were enhancing the, the grade of the plutonium, uh, somehow the software that was controlling those centrifuges centrifuges went haywire and a lot of the centrifuges destroyed themselves by you know spinning themselves up too high um, you know that that was a that was a, a physical damage to the system um, the property of the particular security policy is enforced now what this is saying is you know once you understand all these threats you put in policies in place that are supposed to be uh, protecting the software, and therefore that security policy from a software development standpoint gets enforced. But let's talk about it from another standpoint. What if you have a secure policy of just making sure that you have enforcement, enforcement of a policy of, say, HIPAA laws, which is, you know, your, your, your right to protection of health, or FERPA, which is right to protection of your educational data. Or if you work for, um, if, if you're building software for a law firm, you know, lawyers that are on a particular case have access to client information, but there's client lawyer confidentiality, and therefore no one else should be able to access that data. Well, that means that that whole, in addition to the software itself, there's a policy that the, um, that the firm and the people have to deal with. Well, they have to enforce that policy. So this is Partly software. Did you did you code properly? Did the enforcement uh, 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 work? But it's also policies of how it's used. It really comes down to people, right? So when we talk about enforcing a security policy, we're talking about behavior of humans, and behavior of humans, as you know, is is, is always going to be a problem. Um, confidentiality. You know, there are groups, uh, educators have confidentiality. You know, I'm not allowed to blab your grades around on anybody. Um, um, uh, mental health people have uh, confidentiality. All, all the medical profession has medical confidentiality. Lawyers, confidentiality, and so on and so on. Three things, confidentiality, confidentiality integrity, and availability. Confidentiality, you're protecting the data from unauthorized access. Integrity, you're, you're protecting the actual data values, making sure they are correct. Uh, and that's actually a big deal, uh, or more complex than it sounds. And availability, making sure that it is actually available to the people who are supposed to have access to it. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. I think it's pretty straightforward, right? 
Unauthorized users should not be able to see the information. Unauthorized users should not be able to take, make the computer take actions. The confidentiality is uh, generally, generally encryption is the form that's used here. Uh, maybe we should talk about public key stuff. Uh, I'm going to talk about it actually in the in the in the in the context of, of integrity. Um, integrity again, unauthorized modification. Well, let's see. How do you how do you detect um, how do you detect or verify that the data is has integrity? This comes down to something called authentication, or it can. Uh, so you receive data from somebody, and how do you know that the data was actually correct? That the data was actually created by who who uh, you believe created the data, right? So I create data. Um, you know, I create grades and then you get grades. How do you know the grade you got was the grade that I assigned? How do you know somebody didn't get in there and change the grade? Well, there should be in, in most systems, uh, th th there's cryptography, but there's this notion of, of keys. Uh, a key is a, okay, what is the, what is the crypto cryptographic process? If you take a normal message, we're going to call that plain text and then you encrypt it. And now it's not in plain text anymore, it's in its encrypted form. But in order for it to have any value, you also need to be able to decrypt it. Well, normally the way this is done is you have a key, that, uh, a particular key that will encrypt the data and then another key that will decrypt the data. And the two keys have to fit together, obviously. You know, one key is effectively the reverse of the other. So this is used in two ways. One is to make sure that nobody else can access the data. So if I have the, if I encrypt the data and I don't want anyone to access the data, then you have to have the key to decrypt the data. So I can give the key out only to authorized users. You may have heard of public key encryption methods. You know, you, you um, sign up at the bank and you're putting information in on the bank website. They encrypt that data. Well, how do they decrypt that data? Well, it turns out just because you know the just because you know one key, um, you can't figure out what the other key is. So what the bank does is they give out everybody the key to encrypt the data, and they're the only ones that have the key to decrypt the data. Very clever. So that's why it's called public key encryption. You make the key that encrypts the data public, and then the only one that can decrypt it is the bank. The reverse of that, and this is where we get into integrity, is that only some authorized entity should be able to modify that data. Well, how do you know that that data came from somebody, uh, from, the, from the right person or from an authorized person? You take that public key encryption idea and you turn it around. Now what we say is I'm gonna give everybody the key to decrypt the data, but I'm the only one that encrypts the data. So if I give you encrypted data, and your key decrypts it, it must have come from me. They're very clever systems. And the, the most commonly used algorithm, at least as of a few years ago, was the RSA algorithms. And I believe there's been several improvements to that. You can, you can look it up, RSA algorithm, and, and, and get all the, uh, the math about that stuff. But the main thing we not want to know is just what's happening here in terms of protection. You can use public key encryption to keep your data confidential because nobody can decrypt it except the intended user. And you can use publicly public key encryption to verify that the data came from the person you thought it would by reversing the public and private keys. Hmm. Reversing who gets to hold the encrypted key and the decryption key. key. <laughs> and lastly, availability has to still be available. So when you um, have your data again at the bank site or wherever, you know, uh, that's great that the bank encrypted all your data, but you know, at some point you might want to look at your account balance, right? So it has to be available. Uh, this last term available at system, highly available systems aim to remain available at all, all times. Uh, this is not just about 
cybersecurity, but also about physical security, right? Phys physical uh, capabilities to maintain the system during odd events. And what would be a highly available system? Uh, you know, air traffic control systems. We don't like it when those go down. Um, you know, you traffic lights would be are great, but that that that's you know a relatively low uh, low impact, right? R relatively low risk. Whereas air traffic control, pretty high risk. Um, broadcast systems. In the event of an emergency, we still want to be able to broadcast information to people. Uh, anything that has to do with transactions that take place over time. You start a transaction and something goes wrong. You want either that transaction to still be available for completion or you want the transaction to roll back to act as if it never happened. You're going to buy concert tickets online. You paid your money, but you didn't get your ticket yet. You know, your, your virtual ticket didn't get sent out to you. That's a bad time for the system to go down because now you're out your money, right? You've lost your money. So that system has to be built in such a way either that the whole thing happens, you pay your money and get your ticket, or none of it happens. So there's a, there's a form of security in there. Um, as always, there's three things pick two. Uh, the more confident... <laughs> The more confidential you make it, the, you know, the harder it is to do availability. The more integrity we get, the harder it is to do availability. By the way, has anyone gotten a, uh, a PDF form with an electronic signature? You know, I get these forms periodically, like I have to approve something and it's a PDF and I have to, I have to do my electronic signature. Has anyone participated in that here on campus? Yeah, and it just makes a signature for you. Right, but it doesn't just do that. It actually verifies that Keith Garfield was the one who signed it. And it does that because I have a specific um, encrypted uh, signature and in order for me to put it on there, I have to put in my password. So it has to be my user, basically my username and password in order to, in order to put that signature on there. And then there's a, I think there's like a little uh, hash tag in there, or not, not a hashtag, but you know, a hash in there, a bunch of numbers that, that you can verify, yes, this signature was made by this person on this date. So it's the, the, the bad form, you know, some, sometimes I get stuff and they don't have that. So what do I have to do? I have to a JPEG, I, you know, I sign a, sign a piece of paper a long time ago. I scanned it. I've got a JPEG of it. I paste my JPEG of my name in there. That is not secure. Anybody can paste a JPEG of my signature on, on, a, on a, a digital document. Not secure. But the one that I have to use my password in is secure, and it gives all the meta information there in the, in the field. And when you open the, um, uh, that document, the document will actually look at all the signatures and check. And sometimes I'll get one that says, you know, there's a problem with a signature. It's usually not a problem with the signature. It's usually a problem with the system. Okay, um, let's just talk about layered defense here, or the Swiss cheese. So the, uh, uh, the idea behind the Swiss cheese model is this, you have a layer of defense, but it's got holes in it. So you have another layer of defense, and it also has holes, but the holes are in different places. And if you get enough of those layers, like Swiss cheese slices lined up, you can't see through. There's no, there's no hole all the way through. It's blocked somewhere. You guys are, I'm sure, aware of firewalls. True. Hopefully. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully you, you know, pay at least a little bit of attention to the firewall on your machine. Malware scanners, we're all aware of those. Uh, intrusion detection systems. Now, what are these? What it will take a guess at what, how you, how would you try to in, in detect intrusion? If you, if you were in charge of a system, how would you try to detect intrusion? Or attempts at intrusion? Form of 
foreign logins. Like what? Yeah, yeah, so your computer is hanging out on the internet and it's got entryways called ports and software will just grab an internet IP address at random, let's say, and then just go down to the ports and try and say, I wanna get in, I wanna get in, I wanna get in. Well, your computer obviously can detect that because it has to register that. So it can detect what the IP address is and say, okay, this is really weird. Uh, I have not requested anything from anybody that has an IP address like that. Oh, and that IP address matches you know, North Korea or Russia or Venezuela or Alabama or Canada or wherever, but I don't have any association with those entities. If your computer has requested, like, you know, here you are browsing and you send out a request to go to this particular IP address to go bring in a bunch of data, and all of a sudden a bunch of data comes pouring in from that IP address, your computer should say, okay, that's, that makes sense, right? That was requested. But if data just starts pouring in unannounced, your computer's sitting idle, and all of a sudden data starts pouring in, then the computer um, can, can um, say, well, wait a minute. Now that's right at the border, right? That's at the interface. What if somebody's already inside? What can you do? Well, a similar thing. It's, it's all pattern matching ultimately, because remember, your computer is dumb, doesn't know anything, but it, it can detect patterns. So if you have a pattern of a piece of software on your machine that is activating in a periodic way or sending out data in a periodic way, and that is not a trusted piece of software, that's detectable, right? What if you have a Trojan horse on your software? The Trojan horse is a key logger and it's logging all your keystrokes. And then periodically it sends out a thousand bytes of your keystrokes out to wherever it's supposed to send it to. And maybe it does that, you know, once every five minutes or maybe it does it every 2 a.m. Well, that's something that a, uh, your system could be designed to identify as a pattern and then at least raise the question is this is this in the is this in my trusted pieces of software if yes i'll ignore it if not i'm going to block that transmission or i'm going to notify my user or i'm going to do something everything is pattern detection what do malware malware scanners rely on monitor spikes and system yeah exactly exactly monitor spikes and system usage right so the, so one of the things that's good especially in a network system you know your the school has a network right and um the the, the um they have a, a, i don't know one or two or five gateways i don't know what they have but at each gateway they can monitor the the just the level of network traffic and over time, they can build up a profile of this is what normal looks like. And then when they see something that is not normal, then they can say, I don't know what this is, but it's not normal. Right. Okay, so malware, malware scanners, how do they work? What are they looking for? Code that matches other, exactly. It's, a, it's again, it's pattern matching because these machines are dumb. So here's what happens. Of someone unleashes a virus on the world and the news media goes crazy. And then, uh, and then you know, that's with the, the, the day zero, right? The first day that that virus goes out. But as soon as that virus goes out, people see its pattern and then they add it to their database. And then your malware will look for that pattern. So what does the virus try to do? It tries to disguise itself. It will modify its pattern or a person will modify its pattern. But um, unless you mo modify the pattern very cleverly, there are ways to try to get back to the original pattern or simplify this stuff. So, um, uh, so, so it's all pattern matching. There are people who are trying to build predictive tools 
so that when software comes out and software comes into your machine, that it can be scanned, not for pattern matching, but for actual behavioral matching. And if the behavior seems suspicious, not that the, the code has not executed yet, code is not executed, but they scan the code to try to uh, determine what its behavior might be. And if its behavior seems suspicious, they can put it into a quarantine place. Now they haven't made much headway with that yet. Why? Anyone know why? Let me ask it a different way. Why are you testing your software? Because you know it's not going to work on the first try. Okay, but why? Why can't you just create a piece of software that gobbles up your software and then tells you whether or not it will pass the requirements or not? <clears throat> because it's impossible. Alan Turing told us that in the 30s. It's impossible. It's impossible to build a piece of software that will take in another piece of software as input and tell you what that software does. In the general case, it's impossible. It's possible for limited things, but it's impossible in the general case. That's why no one has built the virus killer that when the virus comes in, it scans it and says, I know what you're gonna do because you can't build software like that. Uh, people are trying to build software like that because the virus has a limited domain. So you can, you can reduce the behaviors to the degree where they're hoping they can catch it before it runs not just pattern matching, but a brand new virus. So that's why you guys test uh, your software. If, if, if you, otherwise, you would have, we would have software tools where you said, here's my requirements and here's my code, and it would say, okay, but, but that's impossible, therefore you test. Uh, local storage encryption tools. How many of you guys encrypt your data on your own computers? I don't, I should, I don't. Um, but obviously within a business enterprise, you really should encrypt everything, even on your own local machine, probably a good idea. You know, For some of your sensitive data, you should encrypt it. And the integrity auditing procedures. Now this has to do with similar to what I was saying before about as a human, am I an authorized editor? Am I an authorized user? But it's also about, um, uh, automated processes. You've heard of blockchain? You know, with blo uh, blockchain management is kind of a new buzzword on some of these business commercials. We're going to protect your system with blockchain management. Basically, you have, uh, uh, there's a couple ways to go. One is you say, my computer talks to my, you know, computer A talks to computer B. Computer B is a trusted computer. Therefore, anything that I get from computer B, I will trust. And I will, I will tag all the information with metadata. This came from computer B. Okay, so there's a little bit of that. But the rest of it is more of doing these complex hashing functions that I haven't looked into the mathematics on that says, look, I'm going to save this data and it's got this metadata next to it. And now if anybody wants to modify it, they have to take that meta metadata and as an authorized user, they can resave this, they can save the new version of the data, but the new version will have the metadata that contains the old metadata modified by the change. And it does so in such a way that you can say, we know that this data was initially created by user A. And when it was modified, the way the metadata is composed, we can verify that this was the original data from user A that was modified by user A, and therefore it's still good data. And so you create, that's why it's called a, a block chain. It's a, I think, I'm not sure about the block, but the chain is that you get a whole chain of verification. From the time that data was created up till its latest version, there's a whole chain of creation and modifications only by authenticated users. 
And again, I, I don't have the mathematics for it. Obviously, on a lot of these techniques, like this, this one slide, you take a whole course on. Encryption techniques, scanning techniques, intrusion detection, you know, all these things. Defense in depth, as we said before, you have your layered security so that you have the Swiss cheese model. Um, what, have, what have you got? One thing I've noticed that, that's becoming really popular is this two factor authentication. What is two factor authentication? Besides annoying. I think you guys have to do this. I know I have to. Yeah, it's like the duo thing um, where you're yeah, verified right. at both, via both your real right. credentials and your duo right. credentials. So you're using, right, you know, now, now they're coming in, using two different devices to verify, double check to make sure it's you, right, so, right, right. Is that defense in depth? Is that an example of defense in depth? Yep. Yeah, because you're adding a layer. It's not just, hey, it used to be username, password. Now it's not just username, password. It's, hey, username, password. Oh, and are you physically in control of this person's phone, let's say, so you can check their check their text message and get a, uh, and get a, a code. Uh, a lot of sites do this one-time entry code. Username, password, then you've got your phone, you get a six-digit code that you can use exactly once. So that's defense in depth because you're adding a layer. Now, what happens once you get inside? Can there be other layers? Yeah, now one, you think through, um, um, once you get into the server on your bank, right? You log into the server on your bank. Hopefully all of your account information isn't right there because if anybody got in there, they could try to poke around and find it. So what do you do? They layer it with physical networks that, have, that are uh, structured in depth. So you have a login manager and a presentation manager on one computer, and then it's networked to say account information. Uh, it's networked to uh, some kind of a verification system so that you, the computer that you're in will ask the account server for your information. Well, the computer that is asking the account server, what's the account server gonna do? Well, wait a minute. Are you an authenticated user? Not you, the person, but you, but that computer. You know, are you a valid computer? Are you a trusted source? So you get these these layers in depth, so that if somebody could break into one layer, they may not necessarily be able to just run ramp, rampant throughout the system. Okay. There's a bunch of security models out there, um, but. I'm going to talk about two. We're using them currently on an FAA project. And it breaks down into two basic models. One is a threat assessment. You're assessing what kinds of threats are out there. And then the other is a risk assessment. Or assessment. You're assessing how bad can it be, right? What damage can be done here? So that's the threat and the risk. So if you have a, a, a threat that's fairly identifiable, realistic, but the risk is very low, you know, you can make a decision to live with that risk. But if you have a threat that is high, oh man, anybody can have a back door to this computer and that lets you in the whole system. And then the risk is high. Oh yeah, then they get all the money or planes crash and people die then obviously that's something that you need to do with. So this is a way to quantify, to try to identify where the threats can come from and quantify the threat that they, or the, uh, the, the risk that they pose to, uh, to you. And uh, nice, nice, you know, uh, acronym STRIDE and, and DREAD. So STRIDE is spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service attack, elevation of privilege. So that's where you get STRIDE. Spoofing, where do you think you're going to see spoofing the most? Have you seen anybody do spoofing? Has that, have, you been, have you been the intended victim of spoofing, do you think? 
Identity theft. Okay. DNS. I, I've not been a victim of identity theft, but is that right. is that any um, no, it's, it's simpler than that even. DNS or SSID. Explain that, Mike. DNS is domain name server, right? That's that's the that's the DNS you're talking about. Here's, here's two places where you see spoofing, one all the time. You ever get these robocalls anymore? We get robocalls at our house and the phone number is that you see like on caller ID, absolutely meaningless. That's a form of spoofing. They're pretend they're, they're tricking the caller ID system into giving a phone number that they're not. And the other one is email, fake emails, right? You'll get emails. Now there's there's a spoofing and there's not spoofing. <laughs> the one that's most common is not spoofing, but you will get spoofing from emails where if you look in the, you know, who it's from, it actually looks like it's from, you know, the provost, or it looks like it's from me, or it looks like from, you know, that that would be spoofing. Where they're tricking the system to make it appear that they are somebody that they're not, either through a fake IP address or a fake. Uh, name like, like in an email or a fake telephone number. Um, usually in the emails though, what they'll do, like if you'll see it's from me and it's really not, it's going to okay. be slightly different. Like it's going to be Keith Garfield, but maybe they'll left the I out of Garfield. So it's G-A-R-F-E-L-D, you know, slightly, slightly different where your I won't catch it. That's not spoofing. That's just someone making up fake emails. Spoofing is where it really looked like it came from my email account. And then tampering, right? That's a threat, you know, like, yeah, as we've talked about, either modifying or fabricating data. Now, re repudiation is kind of a tough one. It, it's not quite tampering. It's basically about the, the authorship. Now you can modify the data, but basically it's about, uh, it's a negative term actually. Non-repudiation means you can't deny it. In other words, if I write, again, if I write my uh, digital signature with the password, then the idea is I cannot later say, hey, I didn't sign that. Because in theory, I'm the only one that has access to that digital signature with its password. If that's non-repudiation. Repudiation is defeating that. What if someone else was able to sign things with using that, uh, a, a pretend version of that secure di digital signature and password? What if someone else was able to do that? Then they could sign documents on my behalf, but I didn't really sign them. Well, that creates doubt about the validity of the data, right? Well, if Keith didn't sign, you know, if Keith didn't create this data, who did? Information disclosure, as that's the big one that always gets in the news, right? Oh, people, you know, 100 million Visa card people, their data was breached. You know, Michael's had a data card breach a few Christmases ago, and Yahoo has a data, you know, has a breach and blah, blah, blah. Uh, again, often that data is still encrypted. So when you hear that, you know, the credit card breach happened, you don't necessarily have to panic right off the bat. Uh, usually, particularly in the media, they're going to give you the top headline and not actually the effect of what that breach could have. I think denial of service, I, I think people are familiar with denial of service. It's, it's you know, de denying service to the valid users. Uh, denial of service attacks are not as common as they used to be. Why? Chips have gotten a lot faster. Internet bandwidth has gone up a lot. And people have figured out how to do this real fast switch. So in order to do the denial of service attack, you have to, you have to attack a particular server, which means you're attacking a particular IP address. But these systems are set up now 
where they can very rapidly switch to another server with a different IP address, advertise to the world that that new IP address is available and get the service up and running on the new IP address uh, relatively quickly. So it's a lot harder to do a denial of service than it used to be. You still see them apparent, uh, from time to time. Often their businesses, some group is unhappy with a business and they wanna you know, do a protest and they'll say, you know, um, I don't know, Exxon kills seals. And so we're gonna, we're gonna uh, do a denial of service attack on Exxon for the publicity of raising some kind of an issue. Uh, elevation of privilege, that's the biggie. What does that mean? I log in and then I make myself an administrator. Now that I'm administrator, I can do all kinds of fun stuff. It's not necessarily always an administrator level. It may be that you, as a student, you have access to this much information. As a teacher, I have access to this much plus a little more. And then as an administrator, they have more. But you know, you would you would probably see the immediate benefit of being able to register in your class as teachers who submit the grades instead of students who just receive the grades. So that's what elevation of privilege is about. By the way, what's the big attack going around now? Not so much, uh, um, not so much viruses that are you know running around the world. Anybody know what the really popular form of attack is right now? The, the, where people are making money, the bad guys are making money. Ransomware, exactly. So what's ransomware? Well, you get an email, fake email, or you go to a website, you know, fake website, or you, you know, you get a fake whatever. And what they do is ransomware, it downloads code and takes all your files and encrypts your files. And then if you want to ever have your files decrypted, you need the key. And they're happy to give you the key for a price. And depending on the system, uh, that price can be pretty bad. Like, you know, for my personal machine, I back stuff up onto a thumb drive and I ever get ransomware, I'm fine going to IT and saying, you know what, just wipe this hard drive out and that would be fine. But what happens is uh, uh, the police departments, several police departments in the US have gotten hit. And not only does it come into one computer, now they're in the network. And remember, once you're inside the network, you're a trusted source. And so they go through the whole network and they grab files all over the place. They go to the central file storage and, and, uh, and, and encrypt all those files. And then they say, hey, you gotta pay us X amount of dollars. And if you look in the news, you'll find that so, you know, in the US, cities, city governments have been hit and paid the ransom. Police departments have paid the ransom. I think some school systems have paid the ransom and some companies have. And it's usually, I think, Bitcoin. <laughs> they, you know, and, and they say it comes with very good instructions about how to do this. Right. Yeah, ransomware is the big thing. Now of these, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, which, which of those categories would we say that, that ransomware falls into? The denial of service, so you're withholding. Yeah, you're denying, you're denying the data to the proper data owner. So that's one. I'd say tampering's gotta be in there because they encrypted all your data, right? Any others? I think those are the big two. Information disclosure is usually when you're disclosing to someone else, not, not disclosing to the owner of the, of the data. And then, so these are the different threat assessment, the, the threats. Now, now, the way you do this, if you're developing a system, which you guys are, whoa, what a spoofed SSID, you might try to log into what you think is your network, but yeah, 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 spoofed DNS is similar. Yeah, yeah, google.com and goggle.com, yeah, right, right. Uh, by the way, thank you, Mike. 
Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Um, if, if you have a mic, just jump right in and, 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 and say it too. You don't have to type it. So um, I know a long time ago, I did type G-O-G-G-L-E.com and I was like, this doesn't look right. And it was acting weird. And, and then I realized that mistake. I noticed that some websites now, if you're like a letter off, they've bought all the domain names that are similar to their sites with the misspellings and they will redirect you to that site. And there's a particular blog that I go to periodically and it kept, what periodically when I would go to it, it would say, well, before you go, you have to pass the security check. And sometimes it would take me right to the site. And I finally figured out that one of the times I was typing, I had it one letter off they had bought that domain name, but they also wanted to verify that you really wanted to go there. So it was a, a proper security check to get to the, to get to the site. So yes, there's, uh, you know what? Remind me to put the Kevin Mit, Mitnick videos up and you'll see how clever people can be. Uh, I'm running out of space to write notes, Kevin Mitnick. Yeah, I need to. Uh, okay, so now that so you, I'm sorry. So you take your your system and you lay out all the entry points and you lay out the internal structure of your system. And this is your threat landscape. And all the external, you know, the interfaces to the outside world are potential sources of of, of threat. Inside the network, you may also have potential sources of threat because you have humans going to machines. And you know how humans are, they're the worst. So there's an opportunity for a human to inject malicious code or be actual bad actors inside your own network. Um, there's a reason why disgruntled employees these days generally will have their accounts shut off immediately. You know, when they get people that get fired, escorted off the, off the premises of a company, they want to shut those accounts down immediately so that person doesn't go in and do some bad actor stuff. Uh, even in the, in the 80s, we had a guy that built all of our software for, uh, for the ground test equipment. This was in a McDonnell Douglas Missiles and Space Company. And um, they, he was, ended, uh, he was uh, ending up having some issues and they uh, let him go and this was pre-internet days, they made sure to have backups of all of the software in a secure location in case he went in and, and tried to do something you know, harmful to the software. Nowadays with the internet, he didn't have to be physically in the building anymore. But you do have to worry about your external threats, your internal threats, even things like physical security. Um, when you're in, you know, with your computer, you have your computer turned on, you walk away for a few minutes, you know, you should have it in a, a closed room or a locked room. There's a reason why it makes me so mad. Ernie keeps timing me out and it really ticks me off, but I know why it's because if I had my computer on my desk in my office, I leave my office door open, I go out just to get a cup of coffee and all of a sudden I need to talk to the chair or something and I'm gone a half an hour. Well, now my computer is unattended and anybody has access to, you know, my emails, my Ernie accounts, that stuff like that. Not that I have valuable stuff, but it's an entry point. Uh, oh, here's another form of attack. It's super simple. You ever find a thumb drive laying on the ground? You know, the memory sticks? Yep. Yeah. And what's the first thing you do? I'm going to be a good citizen. I'm going to return this. So I'm going to plug it into my computer and see who it belongs to. And guess what? You know, it injects malicious software into your machine. Uh, as a general rule, you know, you find the memory stick, uh, take it over to IT and, uh, and, and let their machines get infected. They should be able to check it out safely on a non-network machine and be able to return it to the proper owner or just throw it away because they're getting cheap now these days, right? Uh, I'm writing down social engineering, which we haven't talked about. I need to add these to these charts. Okay. 
This is about secure software development, this portion of the lecture, but there's a whole uh, another aspect to just how bad humans are. You know, you, you create this wonderful secure software, you create policies, but now the people have to enforce the policies. And you know, we don't because we not, we're nice. We try to be nice to people. All right, so once you've established what all your threats are, then for each threat, you can try to figure out what the risk is, right? And then this is the dread model damage, reproducibility, exploitability, affected users, discoverability. Damage, how bad is it? Did I lose all my data? Do I have to pay a ransom? Did the hard drive get burned? Literally. Reproducibly, is this something that someone can do over and over and over, or does this take like a long setup? You know, if someone's gonna, you know, the, the reproducibility problem, that's the, that's the email phishing problem, right? How easy is it? to send out a million emails every hour. And you know, it doesn't take very many people to bite in order for you to start to get some payback with that. Exploitability, how hard is it to launch the attack? Sometimes you need special equipment. So for example, if you want to, um, I don't know, shut down the NORAD system and you know, shut down radar <laughs> or satellite tracking systems, Okay, that's not something you're just going to do with uh, an app off the Google store, right? You may need special, not just special software, special equipment, um, radio transmission devices, this kind of thing, or even uh, special computers, special um, uh, network access. And then affected users, how many people will be in, impacted for how long? Discoverability, how easy is it to discover? Now the key to that is how easy is it to discover afterwards? Why wouldn't you discover the attack afterwards? I mean, you've been attacked, you should discover that, right? Can you think of a situation where you wouldn't discover that you've already been attacked? You gotta think to you gotta learn to think sneaky, right? You gotta learn to think like a bad actor. If the attackers cover their track, yeah. So sometimes you hear people came in, they access some information, and then on their way out, they try to 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 erase all of the records that said somebody came in or somebody accessed this information. So that's that's one. How about attacks that are designed not to be discovered? key loggers, Trojan horses, right? The intent of those is to not be discovered because they're spying on you, right? Spyware. The intent is that they're doing their job by not being discovered. It's not always about destroying data or, or, or stealing data that's in a memory device it can be about stealing data from person who's typing. Yeah, and malware that doesn't activate instantly like a botnet. Maybe you got infected, your machine is part of a botnet and the botnet has not yet been activated yet. And someday your machine is gonna be part of a giant denial of service attack somewhere. All of these things can be really complex. There's a lot of people making good money trying to build up secure systems. There's a lot of research being done to try to figure out how to improve uh, security. And again, because we're more and more connected now. All right, so basically the, the way you use Stride and Dread, you make up your threat landscape, you determine all of the threats. And then for each attack type and vector, you can say, you assign a value to each stride component. And, and you know, it's, it's, just, it's very subjective. It'd be great if it was, if it was a, a, you know, a, a nice algorithmic objective, mathematically correct thing, but it's very subjective. So you say, okay, we're gonna go from one to a hundred and you know, one is no, no threat at all. And a hundred is a pretty, pretty likely threat. 
and you can take your system and for each for each entry point for each attack vector or attack lo potential attack location then you assign a value for each of the stride components and then you average the results and then you say okay that's how vulnerable we are you know if your scale is zero to a hundred maybe with everything you're at like a five when you average the results oh man that's that's we're not very vulnerable but maybe you're at 95 Oh, we are a leaky sieve, right? Anybody can waltz in here and, and, and have access to our system. And then you do the exact same thing with the dread components. So for each attack type that you come up with, then you say, okay, for each dread component, um, I can assess uh, you know, the, the risk based on a subjective one to 100 scale, take an average. And then now I've got for the whole system and each for, for each individual attack type, I can say, okay, I've got a bunch of attack types that are really vulnerable, but there's virtually no risk. But I've got three attack types that are at like the 50-50 scale, right? They're kind of hard to do, but a competent person could do it. You know, a moderately competent bad person could do it. And wow, the risk is huge. It's like 80, 90, and 100. Okay, those are the three we're going to focus on. So these are ways to try to get a, uh, a measure of your system. And again, all of this stuff, we, can, we could spend the whole semester on these things. Which by the way, uh, you know, some of you are in the computer science program, you're gonna take like five or six cybersecurity classes. Okay, specific coding practices. And we'll only talk about a couple. Input validation. I think this is the one, you know, like in CS225, I do mention secure coding a little bit, just a little bit. Input validation. Anytime you get free form. Now, when we think of input, what do you think of? You, you probably think of input from a human user. Is that, that's normally how we think of input? but it doesn't have to be a human user. So input validation, as we think of, uh, um, you know, first do think of as a human user, you got all these, all these um, boxes to fill in, right? The human user fills out their name and their middle initial and their last name and blah, 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 blah. And then what happens? They click a button and some software grabs that data and takes it and, and on the internet, at least it sends it away to a server. And then that server will do something with that data. It is possible in some systems to actually inject commands to return hunks of memory, random memory. You may have heard of uh, SQL as a database, SQL injection. SQL injection is where it looks like you're putting data into the database, but what you're really doing is injecting a command and that command is to maybe return part of the database. So here you are, a user who shouldn't have any real access to the database other than making a simple query and, you have, and you're, you're getting access to the database or maybe access to a portion of the database that you shouldn't have. Now I'm phrasing that as humans creating the input, but it doesn't have to be. There was a famous case within the last 10 years called the heartbeat. And the heartbeat vulnerability, they called it heart bleed, I think. You've got two computers, they don't need to talk to each other that often. But yeah, heart bleed, yeah. So they, they don't need to talk to each other that often. And, and so this computer and this computer, they're connected and they need to make sure they're still connected. But they don't have any business with each other at the moment. So what do you do? This computer sends a message and it says, basically, are you still there? And then this one comes back and says, yes, I am. Well, the message that they were sending in order to verify that everything was working properly was really simple. It was like this one would send the word cat in the number three, meaning here is the word cat and it has three letters. And then this would come back and send the word cat and just echo back cat. And then this one would send, you know, tree four and this would send back tree 
And then this one would say, dog, 10,000. And this would come back and send dog and 9,997 random bytes of memory that happen to be next in the RAM. And by doing that, you're getting random, uh, random pieces of memory. Well, if you do that enough, you're going to get some pretty good stuff. You know, you scan that and you look for little log file entries that say things like admin changed pass username password. Now you've just got an admin username password. Simple stuff. So input validation. Make sure that uh, control characters, things that are actually characters that are used, you know, you guys have all done formatted prints, right? You guys, a lot of you guys have done pointers in C. Make sure that the entry that you're getting doesn't have control characters. Limit the amount of, uh, limit the alphabet that you will accept. If it's supposed to be year of birth, maybe you should only accept integers, right? You're gonna valid, validate that the only thing that was in there was an integer. If it's supposed to be last name, validate that all you have in there are, you know, UTF or ASCII characters. Same trick, output encoding. Authentication and password management. What does that mean? Oh man, it means not only do you enforce an authentication policy, but maybe you don't store the passwords on the same server that the actual user is, is trying to gain access to. Maybe you keep the passwords on another server. So there's two layers there. Maybe you encrypt them. Oh, and by the way, there's no way to decrypt the password. You do it with a one-way encryption. It's called a trapdoor function. Once you encrypt, you can't decrypt. Because if you could decrypt, someone could steal the passwords and decrypt them, right? But if it's a one-way function, then I put in my password. I have a great password. Password. But the, but the O is a zero. Right? Password with the O is a zero. It gets hashed, it gets encrypted. And now I say password, it gets hashed and encrypted and the two hashed versions are compared, not the plain text versions. That's a more secure way. And if it's a one way function, if it's a trapdoor function, then no one can take my encrypted password, password theoretically and decrypt it. Uh, session management, these are timeouts, right? You have been idle for five minutes, bink. Uh, access control, that can be physical access control. That can be locked doors. That can be, um, tell me if this is true. I believe there are some uh, laptops where you have to own a, basically a key, like a thumb drive key, a physical key, and you have to put that in before the computer will operate. And that way, you know, uh, in theory, only the owner of that, uh, of that laptop should be able to use it. Uh, cryptography. Oh boy, all of these things are, you know, master's thesis stuff, right? Uh, error handling. Now, error handling is, a, I think, a big one. Uh, you know, remember in CS225, try, throw, catch? Oh, okay, so the idea behind error handling is, again, you never want your software to be in an indeterminate state. Because once it's in an indeterminate state, by definition, you cannot determine what it will do which means you cannot determine if uh, a, a, a bad user, a bad actor can try to, um, can try to uh, leverage that software access to get access to other parts of the system. And I can't recall details. I remember hearing uh, situations recently where people were like pinging some online system with just utter crap just to see what would happen. And, you know, they got that software into a bad state. And once they got it into a bad state, they were able to then inject commands into the system. I think a lot of the bad state stuff in this, I, I really shouldn't, I should, I should stop talking because I'm not sure. A lot of that bad stuff happens to be with uh, dealing with buffers because once you get control of a buffer, you can start to inject, try to inject bad data and or commands into a buffer. Uh, communication security. We talked about that before, like firewall type stuff or um, making sure you have checksums, making sure uh, there's a lot of talk about how email should be encrypted while in transit. That should be a standard thing now. A lot of email is plain text, stored in plain text and transmitted in plain text. 
guess what, guys? When you transmit something on the internet, it is not a pipeline. It is a broadcast. So anybody can look at anything that you've transmitted via the internet, unless you may take steps to control that, like getting a virtual, um, uh, a virtual connection. Database security, again, protecting against uh, SQL injections. And database security can actually come down to, again, a multi-layered system all by itself. Uh, I took a whole class one time, it was one of my favorite classes, on asynchronous transaction management, which was about how to manipulate databases that are across diverse sections of the internet and how to, how to make a transaction occur in a proper way where again, you knew that it was secure and either the entire transaction occurred or none of it would occur. It's really fascinating, the, the amount of, of systems that you have to put in place to make sure your database actually remains valid. File management, memory management, and then this what, general coding practices. Okay. Now, what Sarah talked about earlier, don't make sure that your code isn't too complex. That would come under, I think, general coding practices. Let's flip that around. How many of you have heard of reverse engineering? And what is it? It's given the finished product, can you figure out how to build it? Exactly. Because as we all know, there we have an alien ship under the mountain in Area 51, and the US government has been reverse engineering this technology since the 50s, right? Since the Roswell crash. That's reverse engineering, right? You get a product and you go work it backwards to figure out how it was made. Do people try to reverse engineer code? In other words, you take a C program and you compile it to an executable. Can you then build a reverse compiler that will reconstruct a reasonable facsimile of that original C program? Is that possible? Yes, it is not just possible. It is something that people do. So how do you protect yourself against that? And it's, this is not intuitive. Have you ever heard of code obfuscation? Okay, and Brandon, you've heard of it. What is it? He might be typing. Making code hard to read what you don't like, right, right, exactly. So I'm always saying, make code for good for the human, good for the human, good for the human. And what obfuscation is about is taking that beautiful code and actually making it awful and putting in useless loops or useless trips to another part of the code. The code obfuscation actually usually happens after, it gets an, you can do it as an automated process, and happens after you compile to some level. Maybe you're down an assembler level or something like that. And the whole point is to protect your code. Now, this comes up primarily in uh, the business community, copyrighted code, trademarked code, trademarked algorithms. You know, people put out patents on software. But we all know that once software is out in the world, it can be duplicated. Therefore, it's very difficult to, to control these trademarks and patents. You know, you put a movie out on on the internet, uh, uh, you know, online, and all of a sudden there's a million right, pirated versions of the movie out there. It's easy to duplicate data. Well, so if you have executable code, someone could take your executable code and reverse engineer it and find out what that patented or trademark process is that you're doing. So what do people do? They actually try to obfuscate their code by making it do useless things. And instead of going from one, two, three, you go from one down to 500, down to 95, and then back to two and do the next useful thing. It is very much not performance-based. It is very much there simply to try to make the reverse engineering difficult. By the way, guess what, peop the, guess what viruses do, right? Viruses depend on pattern matching. Therefore, 
instead of having a new virus, what you may have is an obfuscated virus. You may have the same virus that's just been muddied up with clutter for no reason other than to defeat the pattern matching. Um, so obviously the pattern matchers have to be really smart because they have to try to deobfuscate and then do the pattern match, or they have to try to find the pattern within that obfuscated code. <clears throat> the um, people that I have heard about that are trying to detect malware through behavior, the first thing they do is they deobfuscate. They take out, they go through and look at where the where the calls are. And remember, in assembly, you're calling from line, you know, line to line or memory location to memory location for the next executable section of code. And they undo all those so they have straight line code. And then they can try to figure out what the straight line code does. Same thing with your uh, malware detector should be undoing all the garbage to get back to the basic pattern and see if it can match the pattern. <clears throat> Okay, I've talked about this stuff of data validation, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, and general coding practices, we've gone through some of this stuff. Most of this won't apply here, like using a checksum or hashes to verify the integrity of interpreted code, right? We, we don't do that in, in, in school. Now, the Java virtual machine you're using might, the Python uh, uh, interpreter or, or compiler that you're using might, right? But we don't explicitly require that, that you put that in your code. Um, utilize locking to prevent multiple simultaneous requests. Um, you guys, uh, if you haven't taken the operating systems class, then, then you will. And I know that comes up as a topic in there. But again, in terms of practical coding, we don't usually have a, a need for that. How many of you guys have multi-threaded applications as part of your projects? I don't, I don't, I'm not aware that anybody does. But that's where that would happen. You have multi-threaded applications. They all have access to the same memory space. Oh, OK, there's a problem there. You can get read, write issues where the reads and the writes happen out of sequence. Uh, I think we have <clears throat> talked about this a little bit before. You know, if you open up a Word document and then you try to open it again and your machine will say, hey, I can't open it twice. Right. It's a similar thing, right? You lock the data. Locking occurs a lot in the data uh, database world. How many of you guys have taken CS317 files and database system? I'm hoping you talked about locks in there. Anybody? Nobody? It's a good course. If you have room in your... Yeah, good. It's a good course. CS315, CS317, they're both really good, you know, nuts and bolts courses about, about this stuff. Uh, protect shared variables and resources. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, ah, explicitly initialize all your variables. Yeah, I'm I am invent I am vindicated from from uh, CS two twenty five. As we know, Java will provide default values. Most systems will, and uh, uh, but you should always maintain control of your software. And the best way to maintain control is to explicitly command it to do something. Okay. Oh my gosh! Look at that second bullet. Um, yeah, do I want to go through these elevated privileges as you would think? Um, how would that happen? Let's see. That happens in a more complex system than the kind we get to talk about in the academic world. You have a system that needs to access another system that has uh, uh, needs to do, do some kind of a modification. Therefore, it needs to elevate its capability. Obviously, keep that elevated portion of, 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 of capability as short as possible. This is not about one piece of code. This, these are about systems now, where you request from another higher level source, hey, may I have my, may I have my privileges elevated, please? Yes, you may. Tell me when you're done, because I'm going to remove them. Uh, don't pass user supplied da uh, data to a, to a dynamic execution function. I'm not going to go through all these. You can read through these. Uh, restrict users from generating new code or altering existing code. How can a user generate code?
a user. Uh, maybe if like you take in an input and then never get rid of it. Yeah, there's some, there are some weird cases where the user literally who is, who is, who is using code can alter code. And uh, for those of you that are aware of uh, functional programming languages, you know, you can write programs that write code as they go. They can rewrite themselves as they go. Um, I would imagine in uh, PHP applications that since PHP is a dynamic, right, it's a dynamic web creation, you may be able to construct a way where the PHP tricks itself into writing different stuff. And also, a lot of you guys are using libraries that you got online. Did you get the source code for those libraries? Or did you get like a canned, you shouldn't be able to change this library, executable library? Canned. Good. Yeah, like, like Sarah's team, who else is on that team? Benny, you on that team? Anyway, their team, they're accessing, using the API to access Canvas. So it's probably wouldn't be smart of Canvas to let them modify Canvas code, right? They can only modify their code external to that interface. But if they got the API with source code, then they could modify Canvas code, which probably would not be a secure thing to do. Security testing. Uh, I think there's just what one slide on this. I don't know much about security testing. I'm just going to let you guys read through these slides. I do know that you uh, you can do things called penetration testing. Uh, you can do um, validation of of stored memory periodically to verify that the data hasn't been changed. And there are forensic techniques by which if data has been changed, you can reverse that. You can find out when it was changed, how and, and what was changed and reverse it. Um, but you, people make good money these days attacking systems. Someone comes out with an upgrade to their software system and then you uh, before you deploy it, you put it into a sandbox environment that is similar to the real world, but you know, not connected to the real world. And then you have people come and try to in attack it. And um, you know, there's good money in that. White hat, right? White hat hacking. Hacking used to mean just writing really bad code really fast. And then it became more about, uh, re redefined to be more about in invading, right? Uh, other systems. And you can be a black hat, meaning a bad guy uh, um, um, hacker, or, or, a, or a gray hat, which is neutral, or a white hat, which is supposedly, you know, you're there to, to protect. Um, and that's what um, Kevin, Kevin Mit, Mitnick <laughs> is famous for. This guy was Hacking left and right for a while, got caught, maybe went to jail, and now makes a ton of money doing educational videos and uh, serving as a um, uh, serving as a um, consultant on cybersecurity. So there's a video of him that I need to dig up, and I'll I'll post a link to it. Okay, so that's all great. Now, let's say you do all the secure software, you've got your firewalls in place, you've got smart systems, you've done your threat analysis, risk analysis, dread, stride, dread, blah, 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 blah. What's still your biggest threat to your system going to be? Employees, exactly. The employees. So, here at Riddle, what's the biggest threat to our secure, you know, to, to the to the to the integrity of your grades? What's the biggest threat that that, that software, you know, a malicious software is going to get in there and 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 do something 
you know, erase the fact that you, the, you know, erase your transcripts, you know, so you can't show that you um, have a degree, that kind of thing. It's the employees, yeah. It's the professors and even the students, right? It's the users of the system. And why? Uh, two, two, two answers here. Is it because we each have our own access that can be stolen somehow? Not even stolen. You'll give it away. Not you specifically, but mm -hmm. human error, right? Yeah. Two things. One is unawareness, right? So I, I won't. Uh, so people are unaware of the ways that people can that, that they they can be manipulated. And the other is we're nice. We're human beings. We're nice. We're social animals. Someone says, "Hey, can you do me a favor?" Yeah. Why not? So the, the term that is not in this set of slides, which needs to be, is called social engineering. Social engineering. That's the thumb drive trick. Someone puts malicious software on a thumb drive and then they'd leave it in the parking lot and you find it in the parking lot and you're a nice person. I'm gonna, re I'm gonna find out who this belongs to and return it. And you put it in your machine and you get injected with a malicious code. That's social engineering, relying on the fact that we are human beings and we have connections and we are, um, uh, you know, if someone asks for help and it's within reason, yeah, sure. And there's a long story that Mitnick tells about how he got, this is back in the, oh gosh, might have been the 80s, maybe the 90s, where he got all of the code for a new Motorola phone sent to him just by calling people up at the company and saying, hey, could you do me a favor? I hear you're coming out with a new phone and I'd like to get the code for it. I'm like, well, no, the, I mean, he's more clever than that, right? And they're like, oh no, though, that's that's not our department. That's the, you know, the, the GCU department. And he's like, oh, great, thanks. Who do I talk to over there? Well, you know, the, the head of development is, you know, Stephanie Wilson, whatever calls over there. Hey, I want to talk to Stephanie. Well, she's on vacation. So then he calls someone else and he goes, you know, Stephanie's on vacation. She was supposed to send me this software. <laughs> well, now what is it? The person who's receiving the call, gosh, they know who the head of development is. They know she's on vacation. He must be a regular working person because of, of um, you know, he knows all these details about what's going on inside the company. He must be a uh, someone who is supposed to have access to this stuff. So it's social engineering. You get these um, um, these these requests for help. The other form of social engineering plays upon your fear. That's the one that you guys, I'm sure, are aware of. Uh, I got a text message the other day. We are going to charge seven hundred dollars to your account if this is if this is incorrect reply using this link that we provide for you. Boy, there's a red flag. Right. Social engineering. Or you- Fake social security keeps telling me that I don't exist. What? People who say they're from social security keep calling me and telling me that I oh, don't yeah, exist. Oh yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. And it's tax season now, <laughs> so you're gonna get a lot of that too. And with the, uh, um, with the, uh, checks coming out for the relief bill, you're going to get scams with that. Uh, there's all kinds of those. Usually, uh, you know, the fear ones are usually, you know, something bad is going to happen and you have to act immediately or something, you know, you know, I, 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 every, every year I, I think I get a one or two calls from the IRS. Hey, this is the IRS. <laughs> you're going to be arrested tomorrow if you don't call us back. Yeah, okay, right. So remember that after all this is done, no matter what we do with all the coding practices, the people policies have to work too. Okay. That's all I have. Do we have any questions, concerns, comments? I am going to...